going to be for the stream, not for the room. So. Okay, so yeah, it's all fun. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Amin Shuku. I'm Assistant Professor in the College of Rehabilitation Sciences, University uh, of Manitoba. Uh, let me introduce you Dr. Patrick Inaf. Dr. Patrick Inaf is full-time professor uh, within the School of Engineering at the University of Lorraine in France. Uh, he is uh, the head of the research department's complex system, artificial intelligence and robotics at Loria, an applied computer science laboratory. His research interests lie in the bio-inspired control of uh, humanoid robots. Dr. Naf earned his master's in electronics at the University of Rennes and completed his PhD in robotics. He joined Nancy School of, Mean, of Mines, University of Lorraine in 2013. His uh, passion like in li lies in studying artificial intelligence, interactive robotics, and neural control. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Naf. <laughs> so, we'll be presenting for about 40, 45, mi 45 minutes, let's say, and uh, we will have uh, 15 minutes left for a question and interaction uh, with the professor and the audience. Okay, uh, thank you, Amin. Thank you very much to come here. So, good morning or good afternoon, I don't know. So, hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming from uh, University of Lorraine. Uh, University of Lorraine, it's uh, University in the region of Lorraine in France, and this uh, region of Lorraine is on the east here. So the city is Nancy City, uh, just near Strasbourg and uh, far away from Paris, but very close by train. So University of Lorraine is a big university. We have, uh, for France, it's a big university, sorry. Uh, almost now six, uh, 60,000 students, and uh, the main characteristic of the city is this beautiful place called Stanislas Place from the king of uh, Poland, uh, uh, so it's a very romantic place and a lover place uh, every time. Uh, I'm teaching in the component of the university called uh, Min Nancy, which is a school of engineer, high national school of engineer, which is a very specific system in France. We select the best students uh, among the 10% of students at the national competitions. We select the best students in mathematics and physics. So they, they work during uh, um, two years, for this competition, for this selective program, and after we, we have them in the school. And in this school, we have several departments, the department of computer science uh, I had, and the uh, department of geology, of materials, mathematics, energy, etc., etc. So we have uh, a master program uh, in the School of Engineering uh, of, uh, for uh, generalist uh, engineer, uh, in a domain, and uh, for my domain, it's domain of computer science, which is a very short description of the, of the master program. The students spend three years in the school, then after two years or three years of preparation, this, this selective program. And they are very, uh, they have a high level in mathematics, and during three years, they are in a department, and they have some project to do, of course, like everywhere, and they have a, um, 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 uh, 20 weeks uh, to do abroad, so in different country and then in Canada. Uh, uh, last summer, two of my students uh, went in this city, in the University of Manitoba, working with Amin during three months, for example. Um, uh, so the, the uh, originality of this uh, program called Grandes Écoles in France is that uh, the students learn science, but also management, foreign languages and humanity. So they have a very large uh, scale of competencies, but the base is mathematics and physics, okay? And they speak English uh, very, very well. So it's easy for them to come here, and they speak French also sometime. Uh, so this is for the uh, uh, teaching part that I want to represent today. And so if you want to have this kind of student working with you during uh, three months, it's uh, very easy. You have to send me or to Amin a very short description of the of the internship, and then I will send this to my students, and we said, if you want to go in Canada, I have good connection with Manitoba, and then it's okay. They arrive and they will do for you everything that you want in any domain of computer science. Uh, I am also a researcher in a research lab, and the name of the research lab is uh, Loria, which is a, um, 
a very typical French system. It's a, a lab. It's a, um, a main place where all the teachers are doing research together, even if they are not teaching together. Okay, so we share equipment, we share space, we share a building, and we belong to three uh, different systems. So University of Lorraine, like me, I'm professor or assistant professor, they are the same. And we have full-time researcher coming from the National Research Institute and the National Research Institute of Informatics. So we have full-time researcher, they don't have to teach, they are paying only for research, it's a paradise. And some of persons are like me, you, you spend your life uh, between research and, um, and teaching, like uh, this uh, typical schizophrenic uh, system we have. Um, the lab is, uh, this is uh, par uh, the values from uh, five years ago now, so we are almost now uh, six, uh, 500 persons working in the labs. So approximately 200 now, or one, 180 researchers, so full-time researchers or teaching, or assist professor, assistant professor, sorry. We have administrative staff, PhD students, uh, post-doctorants, uh, several, several engineers, internship visitors every time for every country. And the lab is divided in five departments. So you have the title of the department here, the, the keywords. I don't read in details, of course. But um, one department is the complex system artificial intelligence robotics, which I had. And we are working in neuroscience, in robotics, in human robot interaction, in recommender system, in e learning, in uh, learning analytics, uh, in uh, bioinformatics, in computational biology. And the other departments are working on big data, deep learning. For example, one very specificity is this department of natural language processing. So they are working only in natural language uh, processing and analysis. Uh, department uh, uh, based on the security and services, etc., etc. So on the website of the laboratory, you will have all the description. And my department, we have uh, five teams, sorry. So this team called Kiwi, the name of the team is just joke sometime. So Kiwi, it's a team dedicated to e-education, data mining and recommender system. CAPSID is computational biology. Larsen is autonomous robots. You have the keywords here, and uh, Biscuit is more bio-inspired computing, neural network computing, and the team where I'm working, it's called now Neurorism, with dedicated to computational neuroscience applied to medical, uh, um, medical application, sorry, or to robotics application. So I will detail the team now. Uh, neurosis, we, we neurosis, I didn't change the slide, sorry, it's Neurorism now. Uh, we try to build some model of neural system in the body, so of the brain, uh, and the mo motor nervous system, sorry, sorry, at different scale from the macroscopic scale to the microscopic scale. Me, I am running, like you will see, I am working in the mesoscopic scale. Uh, we applied uh, computational neuroscience, so we developed model inspired from the biology. And we also uh, applied methodology to analyze the signals coming from the brain, like EEG activity, for example. Uh, this is some applications, so general anesthesia, neurorehabilitation, and robotics, human robotics and natural interaction, which I am working on. And we collaborate, of course, for the hospital. And this is just pictures of the equipment we have, so for brain interface, interface robots, uh, the Kinova robots, it's a Canadian robot. Uh, me, I am working on bioinspired neural network for human red rope and shaking. Um, I did that uh, 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 four years ago. Now I have a lot of works on this. And some robotic platform we shared in the laboratory. Uh, uh, smart apartment, paper robot, iCub. We built this robot called Min with my student of Min. So it's a Minoid robot. And uh, we received last week the Talos robot. So now uh, Talos is in this box. It doesn't work for the moment, but. Uh, uh, tell us, it's a human with robots uh, the size of human. Okay, so if you want details, uh, I can explain you uh, some things about how we are working and the different uh, different topics of the laboratory. So now I switch to my uh, presentation. So uh, the title is Vision-Based Human-Robot Motor Coordination uh, Using Adaptive Central Pattern Generator. So it's uh, how we can use uh, uh, bio-inspired controller to make the robots uh, able to interact better with the human. So the outline of my presentation here, um, I will introduce uh, uh, 
some my point of view of human movement, and after I will present you what is central pattern generators, different models, and uh, some experiment results of experiment. So, for my point of view, uh, human, what is human movement? You know, we have reflex, etc. Uh, but if you are looking the different uh, gesture we we do every time, every day, we have rhythmic movement and discrete movement. So, rhythmic movement is like locomotions, walking, running, swimming. Uh, uh, cleaning, brushing, cooking, sometimes different gestures. And in sport, when you are doing basket, uh, you are playing like that, so it's a rhythmic movement, but suddenly you, you push the ball, sorry, and so it, it switched to a discrete movement. And discrete movement, it's a more static when you want to take an object, or dynamic when you are doing sport. So every time we have to switch between rhythmic movement and balance movement. And what we know is that rhythmic movement are more engaged, are more uh, used for engagement between persons. So they are one of the modality of human interactions. And uh, rhythmic movements are non-regular for upper limbs, of course, for arms. Rhythmic movement is automatic for walking. Um, but they are regular for, for uh, lower limbs, for legs, we, when we are walking. And discrete movement in inverse situations, so it's uh, regular for upper limbs, but not regular for lower limbs. Okay? But we do the same rhythmic, we switch between rhythmic and, uh, re and um, discrete movement with the arms and with the legs every time when you are playing football, for example. So rhythmic movements are very primitive and automatic um, gesture, movement. And uh, we know that interactions uh, and inter interactions and interpersonal coordinations are often based on rhythmic movement. So that is a, a key uh, to uh, work uh, on robot or to work on this point of view. How we can use rhythmic movement to make the robot better, uh, uh, to make the robot able to have better interaction with the human. And the main properties in inter personal interaction are very well known in psychology, in uh, experimental psychology. Uh, for example, when two, several persons are working to together, suddenly you are able to observe the person working in the coordination. The legs are working together, it's synchronized automatically, naturally. So naturally, some emergence of coordination uh, arrived between several persons naturally. So this is very interesting because in robotics, when you are doing to build a PID controller to make some uh, coordination, it's very difficult. So in the nature and the human body and animals, it's automatic and natural. So the question is, what are the mechanisms uh, uh, in that, able to, uh, that are able to produce this kind of natural uh, uh, coordination? Uh, in applause also, there are a lot of work. You have uh, rooms with 1,000 persons, they applause, and after several seconds, it is the same rhythm uh, that appears, the same frequency. So there is a compromise every time. We are doing inconsciously a compromise every time between this kind of, um, of, of mechanism, so natural interaction, natural coordination, and voluntary coordination, so involuntary coordination and voluntary coordination. So the question is, interpersonal coordination are based on synchronization of movements, so what are the, what, how we can modelize or we, how we can model this kind of system, and we know of course that uh, our movements are, are driving by neural networks. So there is a famous experiment uh, did by Richardson, for example. So two persons are looking together, they are moving this kind of object like that, they are looking together, and suddenly, suddenly, or after sequence, the movements are coordinate, synchronized in fa phase or in opposite phase. It's totally natural, okay? And if you know something from the physics, some nonlinear oscillators, it's the same phenomena. And when you, we are... Um, we saw my mouse, yes. When, uh, in this experiment, when they record the data, the movement, we can see sometimes some coordination, some desynchronization, some synchronization. And if we plot in the plant phase, the movement, it is uh, a cycle limit. So the system composed by the two persons converge to a very stable cycle limit, and then the person are synchronized uh, in phase or in anti-phase, okay? So it is very interesting phenomena because this kind of physical phenomena exist in physics, in oscillators, 
And uh, I will show you some now uh, experiment about this. Um, this experiment is very famous. You can do that with your student if you want. So you have a lot of metronomes. You start the oscillation of each metronome uh, um, randomly. And um, each metronome are its own frequency, but they are close together, OK? So you just have to start randomly and wait and observe what happens. Uh, so I have to accelerate. So after several times, some of them start to be synchronized, OK? And uh, after several minutes, you have a global, you have an emergence of only one coordination, like that. And I think one is, uh, this one doesn't want to synchronize easily, but after it's forced by the, the, by the other. So you have the emergence, emergence of a phenomena of natural synchronization without connection. So uh, it's uh, the explanation comes from the, some vibration are going on the plates, and then each oscillator is able to synchronize to external signals if this external signal has a frequency close to its own frequency. Okay. Okay. Now it's synchronized. Okay. And so this is this. Each metronome is an oscillator, mechanical oscillator. We have the equations, and we can reproduce this uh, idea of using oscillator to control complex robots. So imagine that one uh, metronome is a motor in a complex system, and which this, oh, I have to stop, sorry. Uh, for example, this um, robot salamander built by uh, Oak, is Spirit in EPFL, Lausanne, uh, so we use a nonlinear oscillator to control this robot with any model of the robot. And the robot is able to switch between, between two main oscillations when he's swimming and when he's walking. Okay? And he, he, he uses, he exploits the abilities of the, of the oscillator to synchronize together and to synchronize to the dynamic of the robots. And we can do that also in simulation. Oh, sorry. I lost this video. Okay, that's life. So this is a, a simulation of a Myriapod robot. You have uh, several legs, and you can control each, mo each motor by one nonlinear oscillator, and you launch the program, and you have no coordination between the legs. But after several sequences, due to this ability of non oscillator to synchronize to themselves, to together, you have a global. Um, you have an emergence of a global coordination automatically without any um, uh, model of the robot. OK? Oops. So we start from this uh, concept to say, OK, now we want robot to interact with humans, so we have to understand how humans interact together. And one very simple gesture is the handshaking. Every time you handshake, depending on the context, etc., etc. And we did a lot of experiment between uh, persons. And we collect the data, and we show that uh, in handshaking, you have exactly the phenomena of synchronization. After the contact, in this picture, you have no contact here. After you have one contact, you have a transcend phase during the contact. And after, you have the emergence of synchronization between the two, two arms. So it is a physical synchronization. Okay, but this synchronization uh, can be very short or can be long, depending on the context. If you have sad, if you, it's a sad con sadness context, sad context, sorry, you can say, okay, sorry, I'm with you, you lost your, your friends, etc. So I see it's so long, or Trump and, and Macron are sh and checking together like that, okay. So we are able to measure the force, etc. So we characterize the handshaking in terms of force, in terms of duration, in terms of frequency. And that is, that is good to, uh, to, to say, OK, if I want to control my robot for handshaking with a human, I have to know which frequency, which force, and, when, and how long he has to do that. OK? So the movement, uh, rhythmic movement of the body, are controlled by specific neural networks called central pattern generators. And these central pattern generators are very well known in biology. So we have these structures in the spinal cord. And uh, it's for swimming, for locomotion. It's the same structure from insect than in for us. OK? So it's very primitive structures. And we don't have any uh, uh, detailed model for that. We just have some scheme. For example, this scheme of Reback. So some biologists uh, study these uh, CPGs. They record them in uh, crayfish, for example. But in the human body, it's impossible. 
So we have some description of this kind of CPG. What is a CPG? It is a group of neurons able to generate some rhythm, okay? And they have feedbacks coming from the body or from the environment, and they change their rhythm depending on these feedbacks. And they have, uh, CPG have then a rhythmic um, uh, generator level and a pattern formation level, which is composed of inter neurons that modulate the rhythm, and after they send uh, message, the sensory signals to the motor neurons uh, which are uh, control the muscles. And you have feedbacks coming, coming here and it is well known that the CPG are totally autonomous structures. There is a famous um, experiment called the Decebrelet cat and so some science scientists long time ago cut the link between the brain and the spinal cord and the cat is able to walk automatically and the walking gait depending on the uh, velocity of the treadmill where the cat is, the cat is, uh, is, is um, walking, okay? So CPGs are autonomous neural structures able to control our movement, but they receive signals from the brain depending on what you want to do. You want just to walk or you want to explain something like I'm doing here, okay? So we have a lot of detail uh, of this kind of structures just uh, in terms of schematics, uh, uh, schematics uh, scheme, sorry, of these structures. So I don't go to these details, but we can try to build or to propose a model of this kind of CPGs, okay? And CPGs, uh, now it's now, they are able to control the rhythmic activity of muscles, of, of limbs, but also to switch to discrete activity, discrete movement. So the question is what kind of model I can use? There is a lot of um, models from the past, you can, not from the past, but used now. Very famous model, the Matsuoka model, used by a lot of scientists in robotics, Matsuoka model, OPF model. But this model have some properties very interesting, but for, for me, not very, um, they are not able to do something, specifically switch between rhythmic movement to uh, discrete movement. For example, Matsuoka was very used, is very used in robotics to control robots, but Matsuoka model, and Matsuoka said that himself, it's impossible to use the Matsuoka uh, neural oscillator model to switch, to switch from uh, oscillating to discrete activity. So we propose a model of a CPG like this, okay, with several levels, like on the left, so the rhythmic level, the, the formation level, and the motor level. And what I said, I didn't say, sorry, before, in this CPG you have the side of for flexion, the side for extension. So it's a half center model of oscillation. You have inhibitory connection, etc. And the question is which kind of model I can use for the rhythmic, because it's the center of, um, or, or it's the center of, it's, it's, it's the main um, important part of the CPG. What kind of model I can use to exhibit this uh, rhythm, okay? Feedbacks, it's easy, just, you just have to use sensor, sensor, signals from sensors, and formation level is just simple neuron like sigmoids. So we use this kind of model, this is an equation, it's not important to understand them for now, but the main characteristic of this model proposed by Roatil Severson is that this model is able to reproduce exactly the main behavior of the natural CPG registered by the biologist. So you have here the pictures of the biologist and the picture we did by our model here. And this model, inside this model, the key is this uh, function, which is a nonlinear function controlled by only one parameter. And this function can be linear, nonlinear, and nonlinear with the negative uh, slip, uh, sl slope, sorry, parts. And then you have a nonlinear oscillator, we said also relaxation oscillator in physics. And this model is a general model of the Van der Poel oscillator, uh, if you know this kind of oscillator called uh, studied by the famous scientist Van der Poel long time ago. And then by this model, we are able to control the frequency of oscillation after, um, um, after a threshold. We are able to control the frequency of the oscillator just with one parameter. And then we are able to generate some kinetic energy by the two parameters, sigma f and sigma s. So we can control, if we can control this point, on the surface, you have here a lot of, you have a very fast oscillation, but here you don't have any oscillation, just have a damping behavior, so it's a discrete movement, and here you don't have any uh, oscillation. So we can control this 
difficult system because it's a dynamic system. We can control his dynamics, his rhythmic activity only by two parameters. And it is very interesting now. So we implement in this model some learning rules based on the Hebian plasticity. So the parameters who is uh, driving the frequency has a learning um, rules described here, depending on external signal F connected to the CPG. This signal can be uh, visual signals, force signals, movement, or uh, velocity, position, what you want coming from the robot, for example. Okay? So then this uh, parameter is able to change its value depending on this external signal. Then you control the frequency. And the, frequency is able, the, C, the CPG is able to adapt its frequency automatically to the external signals. And we had other um, learning rules to control the amplitude of the output and uh, some adaptive gain, so adaptive synaptic uh, connections. Okay? And then this is the model, more detail of our CPG. So you have an input signal coming from the outside, from uh, proprietive signals or exterative signals from the, from the robots. And the output of the CPG controls the robot joint. So you can control the velocity, the position, what you want. Okay? And we have feedbacks, and we have also to know, now we have to decide which kind of feedback. So I can control the velocity of my motor, I will uh, connect uh, the force, then the torque, so the force value inside the, the arms to my CPG, but uh, which kind of other feedbacks I can use? Uh, visual feedbacks, position feedbacks, etc., etc. So we did, we used this kind of model to control and to learn motor coordination with robot now. And uh, after the handshaking, which is very complex, we do uh, handshaking with robots, with the, but it's difficult because handshaking is a physical um, act. And when you, you take, uh, uh, when you use a robot, uh, cost uh, four, uh, 40,000 euros, and you want to unshake the robot, sometimes you break some motor, so you don't want to unshake easily, okay? So, but we are planning to do this new experiment with uh, Franca robots. Uh, uh, in, um, in January. So we start from another interactive gesture rhythmic, which is the waving, hello, okay? And hello is the same, so you are doing hello with uh, friends, hello, how are you, like that. And some uh, scientists show that uh, the automatically the, the two arms are synchronized together in phase or in anti-phase. And when you are doing sport, swing like that in a group is the same. You have the professor who is doing sport and you are doing the same movement and all the person will be synchronized in phase or in anti-phase. Except sometimes one person who, which has difficulties of motor coordinations. Uh, and then they show that the arms are synchronized together, but also the brain, because your brain is synchronized to your arm, your arm is synchronized to the other arm, and the other arm is synchronized to the brain. So the two brains are synchronized together. And then this, uh, is this, is this is a, uh, a trace, or is this a, um, a proof of the engagement between the two persons, okay? And this is an emotion state you are just by doing this uh, gesture. So we use this kind of CPG to the robot paper, we applied one CPG to control the shoulder and one for the elbow. The robot is looking in front of him, so a person will do the waving. And we use the visual uh, uh, flow, um, uh, to, we apply it to the first CPG uh, for the shoulder. And the output of the first CPG is connected to the second out, to the input of the second CPG to make coordination between the different joints, okay? And the CPG is, uh, the parameters of the CPG are fixed initially um, for, um, way for to, to, uh, to have a known frequency close to the human movement. We know it is one hertz, a lot of time, so we set up the parameter of CPG just to have a rhythmic, natural rhythmic activity of CPG of one hertz, okay? And this is the first experiment. So my PhD uh, student, Melanie, she, she did this work. Famous, uh, very good PhD student. And then she waving in front of the robot. The robot is looking at her and it starts to synchronize and she will accelerate after. And you have here the different values, the values of her movement and the movement of the robot. And this is when she waves uh, slowly and when she waves uh, uh, faster. 
and you can see that the robot is able to synchronize. So it's not exactly mimetic. The robot is not doing exactly the same gesture in terms of amplitude. He has his own uh, properties, mechanical limits, etc. So he's just able to synchronize and doing the same gesture globally, but with the same frequencies. That is very important. Okay? And for the second experiment, it is the same. And we are uh, looking here the parameter uh, of the CPG, and they change dynamically because we implement uh, 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 HEB plastic rules. So it's a neural plasticity inside the CPG. And there are parameter changes depending on what the robot is perceiving from the human. Okay? So this first experiment shows that waving back experiment, uh, that waving back with the robot is working. And the question is, OK, we have this kind of uh, fast portrait. Uh, and it's very close to what we see uh, at the beginning of the presentation, where two persons are doing this gesture. So we show by this uh, fast portrait that the rhythmic cells and the rhythmic, um, the dynamic of the CPG is synchronized to the dynamic of the robot, and then this system is synchronized to the dynamic of the human movement. Okay, so we have several dynamical systems, and they found um, uh, only uh, 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 own frequency together. So we have a fi finally we have a only one dynamic system, and when you do it, uh, when we do we we do it, we did that uh, with uh, several persons, ten wavings. We saw exactly the same. Uh, parameter. This is the fast lock wave value, which is a parameter, an indicator able to show the synchrony. Um, and then when this value is close to one, you have a synchrony. And after, and not close to one, it's uh, non-synchronized. And you can see for every person is the same results. Okay? So you are going to the robot, say, hello, Pepper, how are you? I'm waving to you. And the robot is synchronized. And when you disrupt the frequency, the gesture, you accelerate, you have a um, a transcend phase, the robot is lost, and after he find uh, again the frequency. Okay. Um, so we do that also for complex movement, uh, like this circle. Circle is in two dimension. Waving it's only one dimension. Circle is two dimension, and we uh, design this circuitry, the CPGs. So one CPG is connected to the shoulder and he receives the horizontal flow. Another CPG receives a vertical flow and uh, without any filter. It's just very simple uh, signals and we apply these signals to the CPGs and then the robot is able to reproduce a circle uh, and the same frequency. Okay? And also for infinite sign, which is the famous mathematical sign, which is a more complex, the robot is able also to do this sign. It's not perfect in terms of trajectory, but it's not important. What is important in this fast portrait, from a position without any movement, the robot switch to a rhythmic gesture, and after he's synchronized, he's, he's synchronized to the human movement, and when the human movement changes the frequency, the robot changes his own frequency. So he learns motor coordination with the human, without any description of the, of the movement, without any model of the robot. Okay? So, but the question is, can robot, can CPG achieve both rhythmic movement and discrete movement in a very uh, separate, uh, in when you have discrete movement and CPG and rhythmic movement, sorry. So we use the same equations and uh, the same um, uh, model of, um, of uh, the um, uh, rhythmic neurons, sorry. And um, suddenly we have an idea, we said, okay, maybe if this parameter is, is equal to zero, maybe we will find a discrete controller. And we do that in the equation, it's just simplified here. And we show that uh, with, when this parameter is, is equal to zero, with the oscillator, is equal to a PID controller, okay? Which is five minutes. Okay, I have to accelerate. Thank you. And then a PID controller is able to control a rhythmic, uh, discrete movement. Sorry. So we did that with the, this Kinova robot, uh, Canadian robot. Okay. So uh, the robot is going with a discrete movement because we we give the robot the position of uh, of the human head with a camera. Okay. And the robot is joined the hand and then it start a rhythmic movement just by switching the parameter sigma f from zero to a value, okay? 
And we show here the results on another experiment. You have the portrait phase of uh, each joint of the robot, so we control three joints. From the initial position, you have the discrete movement and after the rhythmic movement, okay? So the other question is that, can we do that with um, um, upper body movement using a single 2D uh, camera? So we use open pose and we connect to open 2D open pose. I think you know open pose algorithm or system. And we are able to calculate uh, the 3D position uh, by using open pose. And the question is, can we have mimic just without CPG or using CPG? I mean, open pose give me the position in three dimension, okay? So I can use directly the joint value and control the robot without any CPG, without any learning system, without any neural network. And the question is, um, if CPG uh, give some more abilities or give something to the controller. So we have the different um, um, results here. So discrete movement, uh, on the left it is uh, direct geometry, so without CPG, and on the right it is with CPG. Okay, so when you are looking, you, it's almost the same, but finally we show that when the robot is switching from discrete movement to rhythmic movement, it's not the same. Discrete movement, uh, uh, geometric control or CPG control is almost the same, but when you switch from discrete movement to rhythmic movement, then CPG uh, makes the robot able to synchronize rapidly, okay? Like you are looking here. So the, the results are better by using CPG. And just to finish, um, I have another PhD student who use the PhD student, sorry, who use the same control approach using CPG, but to emulate and to simulate the walking, uh, walking ga human gait. And he used the famous OpenSIM simulator coming uh, from uh, um, Stanford University. And we connect the CPG to the muscles. And then we have a very biological simulation. I just finished on this. And we can make the, the mannequin able to walk naturally. It's uh, difficult to set the parameter. Of course, we have uh, 2,000 parameters. But finally, it's not enough. It's not too much difficult because the abilities of each CPG to synchronize to an external dynamical system help the global system to synchronize and then to uh, make emergence of uh, a motor coordination. And by using the properties of, uh, of control of discrete movement, we can exhibit, like you see on the, on the right, some reflex control uh, when the, the, the human is going down forward or falling down forward or falling down backward, okay? And by controlling the parameter of the CPG, we can have a fast walk or slow walk, and we can also stop the walk of the, of the mannequin. It's ongoing work, so it's not perfect for the moment. So to finish my talk, um, uh, it's, uh, for me, interesting to use this kind of controller because first, uh, now we have robot inspiring from human body, it's a human design, human robotics. And so we, well, we want from them to do the same task that we do every time. So it's important to have, I mean, it's my point of view, the same controller, okay? And by using the properties of these uh, oscillators, we use this model, but you can use another model more simple, if, simpler model if you want. Uh, you use the properties of uh, natural synchronization of CPG. You can control a very complex system like a robot with a lot of joints, okay? And this lot of joints are for me like the old metronome we saw at the beginning of my talk, okay? and they are able to synchronize to the gather and to make a global motor coordination. And now we try to use this for uh, elderly person to help them to do some rhythmic movement in a hospital and the robot is synchronized to the person and he can change his, his um, rhythmic movement to destabilize the person and the person will learn to synchronize to the robot and then the robot force the person to do these gestures. And we do that, we, will, we want to do that also for uh, autistic children for motor coordination and rehabilitation because it's well known that autistic children have a lot of problems of motor coordinations. 
Okay, thank you. This is the pictures of my uh, three PhD students. So Melanie, which defined in uh, 17 of June. Baptiste, he was working with a company to do an industrial plant. And uh, Andre will defend uh, uh, 17 December, next week. Andre work on the humanoid, on the human work, and Melanie on the paper robot. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Enough. Um, we still have uh, like 10 minutes for uh, some interaction, comments, or questions. So uh, if you have some questions, feel free to raise your hand. I have a question here. So just to confirm, you're using join coordinates to feed to your pattern generator? So you're, you're, you're capturing with Kinect probably the joins, coordinates, and you feed those coordinates to yes, your pattern generator? Yes, we can use any um, feedbacks from the robot. We can use join value, position value, velocity values, but we can use also torques uh, measurement. It depends of what you want to do in kind of gesture. So it doesn't matter what kind of data. You can pretty much synchronize with any sort of data. Any external rhythmic system. That has pattern. Yeah, yes. it's a proper nat property of oscillators, of nonlinear oscillators, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question from Dr. Um, Chair. Thank you very, Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for the, the feedback. Um, thank you very much. I come from the human motor control side, and typically in our models, there's a role for feed forward control in order for humans to be synchronized and to achieve the timing goals. I wondered if that's something that you're considering with your robot interactions. Sorry, I don't. Un, I don't. Oh. I didn't listen very well. So in terms of so in in human motor control, we yeah. talk about a, a feed forward control and yeah. being able to anticipate the feedback, and so that we have when we begin to move, we have based on our experience the expected sensory feedback that we're looking for, yeah. and the idea is that that allows us to update our movements more rapidly. Um, and so you see that in older adults or people with cerebellar damage, for example, when they're dependent on only visual feedback, for yeah. example, their corrections are always lagging behind. And I wondered if the idea of a feed-forward controller is something that... Yes. Um, it depends on the task you want to do. So if you want to do a very um, uh, precise task, a very accurate task, Trajectory, thank you. Accurate trajectory, uh, you have to, uh, we have to add something in our control because we are not able to do uh, accurate trajectory. Okay. We are just uh, working on very simple gesture you are doing every time in our daily life. When you are cleaning a table, you are not looking if you are doing this circle exactly. You just are brushing like that, uh, okay? okay. And, but it is very simple uh, movement. And uh, uh, the other PhD student I have is working in a company, in a steel plant company, where uh, workers are doing in the li font liquid, come on, font, la font liquide. It's a steel, steel plant company. So they are working near the fire, they are cleaning something. It's very dangerous work. And it's, but it's very simple gesture. It's the same gesture you are doing in your kitchen. So the question is if we can do that with industrial robots that oh. are used before for accurate trajectory, okay? okay? So we are not, I am not working on accurate control, just to make the emergence, natural emergence of very simple gestures that we do every time. Okay, in, in terms of the working and observing from others, do you, have you measured the delay between the robot and what the person is doing? It's, it's a question, important question, but it's we measure, but it's difficult to answer exactly because we have different delay. We have the delay due to the um, electronics of the but robot, of yeah. course. We have delay due to the parameters, the dynamic of the system we use, the control system, because it's a dynamical system. And we can change this dynamic, but uh, like every dynamic system, if you want this system to be more, to be faster, then it will be more instable. So it's, but 
when we wave, it's uh, the the video is not it's a natural time. It's not we didn't accelerate the video. Mm -hmm. So the robot takes maybe one or between one or three periods of gesture to synchronize himself. We can adjust this time, uh, but it can destabilize also the synchronization. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question here. Uh, so to add on to the, the first question about um, the different kinds of data going into your CPG controller, um, would it be feasible that you could have it, the data come from something other than a camera, like say sensors on the joints, or would, that, would you need an infeasible amount of sensors? Uh, we can use uh, uh, signals coming from the joints, mm -hmm. like I said before. Um, and you can you or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yes, something. we can use that. Of course, uh, it's a property. It's uh, uh, um, it's difficult to explain that we can use anything. But right. if you want to have your oscillator to be synchronized to a, a external system, you can use it. You can use you you can do it. Uh, 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 for example, uh, rhythmic music. You can do that. The system will synchronize right, okay. to the main frequency. Right. Because he right. do uh, he's apply also like a filter. Right. So if he will filter, he will filter the, the music and will find the main frequency and will synchronize on this. Thank you. Thanks so much for the question and the uh, quality answers. Uh, you have a question over there? Any other questions? I have a question there. Hi, I'm gonna try to be loud <laughs> enough. Um, so I have a question about the last part that you talked about, the older adult part and the um, autism spectrum disorder stuff. Um, so oftentimes uh, older adults or um, older adults that may have some type of um, cognitive issues or even children or even adults with that are in the autism spectrum disorder, um, they have movements that are different <laughs> from the rest of us. And I think that's why you might be looking at them, but they can be a bit jarring um, yeah. or things like that. And I'm wondering if you've considered, you know, at what point the robot should stop emulating that because it might be seen as though the robot is mocking them or um, making fun of them or things like that? Um, yes, uh, the robot can um, continue to, uh, the finally, uh, is the end of the work actually. So we can learn some different kind of movement, but the question is how we can code this to give the robot to have different kind of movement. He learns waving, he learns uh, uh, dancing like that, uh, but after we have to, s to store this uh, learned uh, movement in the robot, and then we have to extend uh, the, the different values of the parameters and make um, 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 like a mind um, table or like a mind map uh, and to choose the different values of the parameter depending on what you want to do. If I want to wave my hand and also to dance, okay, it's difficult. So of course, it's, um, uh, uh, we can go to this, okay, but uh, it's the future of the work. And, uh, but also we are, we are very limited by the robot capacity, mobility. Uh, the paper robot is a very useful robot, but it's very mechanical, poor design. So we have a lot of limits. And if you want to use this another kind of robot, maybe we will do better uh, gesture, more accurate, for example. Uh, but we have several limitations, depending on the robot and depending of our methodology. How we can general, generalize this approach to learn different kind of, uh, of movement. And the, the other question is how we can design a global circuitry. Because we have the signals coming from the brain, Okay, and then this is the start signal for the movement, but if I want to stop, so we use uh, some, we are trying to use some different approach to control the rhythmic activity of the CPG, mm -hmm. and then to inhibit some CPG in a global architecture. Okay, that's uh, what we are doing now. 
Thank you. Any other question in the room? No. Okay. Uh, thanks so much again, Thank uh, you, I mean. Dr. Naf. And uh, please upload the uh, Professor Naf. I Thank you very much. Thanks again once more time. And I hope to, uh, we hope to see you again once you have updates about those uh, very interesting projects. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you very much.